Welcome back to Crossroads. Today I'll be going into how Chinese billionaire Guo Wenghui has released compromising photographs and videos of Hunter Biden. So stay tuned. Cases of the CCP virus have been resurging. I'll be giving an in-depth update on the virus situation around the world. Also, a wave of compromising photographs and videos of Hunter Biden, son of Democrat presidential nominee Joe Biden, is being published by G News, which is a media outlet run by exiled Chinese billionaire Guo Wenghui. I'll have more information on this. And also, I'll be speaking with Bishop Aubrey Shines about race politics and whether they actually hold any sway over the upcoming elections. Welcome back, everyone. Now, first off, it's flu season again. And as cases of the CCP virus are resurging, many parts of the world are also bringing back lockdowns. Now, with this, I'm going to start giving updates again on the virus situation, while also making an effort to keep it succinct and to cut through some of the noise. Now, first off, you might remember that while Europe was keeping travel to the United States closed, it was planning to reopen travel with China. Now, part of that was based on the assessment of the CCP's claims that it has the virus outbreaks under control. But new lockdowns and recent news suggest the Chinese regime is again covering up the outbreaks. Now, Chinese authorities recently held a mass test of every person in Qingdao, which was around 11 million people. And afterwards, it told the world it found zero new cases. Chinese state media is reporting that the CCP is, quote, leaving the world in awe with its rapid testing. But even local residents in China don't seem to believe the local authorities. Now, the Epoch Times has launched an investigation into these claims. They found that many people they've spoken to in phone interviews do not buy the CCP's claims. Again, an official at the Qingdao Municipal Center for Disease Control Prevention told the Epoch Times in a phone call to, quote, just trust the government, and added, quote, as long as it's been issued by the government, there should be no issues. Just put your mind at rest. Now, while it appears the CCP is downplaying the number of cases, meanwhile, it's also raising the alarm with the overall situation in China. The CCP is carrying out many large-scale testings like this. In Xinjiang province, for example, local authorities are testing 4.75 million people in Kashgar. And on that, they've reported just 138 new asymptomatic cases. Now, in response, the regime deployed a team to carry out nucleic acid tests, assessments, and what China News says is the, quote, investigation of key populations. Now, it's unclear what the meaning of that will be, but Xinjiang is the main home of the persecuted Muslim Uyghurs, so it's possible the, quote, key population is referring to them. Now, after the cases were reported, Chinese state media CGTN reported that many flights were canceled in Xinjiang at Kashgar Airport on October 24th. And while the CCP is reporting new virus cases in that region, the real number of confirmed cases is still really unknown. The regime's overall response in Xinjiang has been heavy-handed. You might have seen previous reporting we had on the lockdowns there. People being chained up outside their homes. People being punished publicly. People, for example, being forced to take medicine, unknown medicine, in front of Chinese authorities. Now, four townships in Kashgar were designated as high-risk areas on October 25th. And Kashgar is a city of 10 counties and one autonomous county. And if the virus outbreaks in that region were serious enough for the CCP to bring about new lockdowns, this may raise concern about travel during China's October holiday season. Now, Kashgar received around 744,200 tourists just recently. And also, more information is emerging on how the Chinese Communist Party covered up the virus outbreaks in the early stages, including through false reporting in medical journals. Dr. Li Mengyan, a Chinese virologist who has defected to the United States, told Newsmax on October 12th that the CCP was recruiting scientists and was working through overseas collaborators in a large-scale effort to fabricate information. She said this included attempts to mislead the public through false reporting in journals that include Nature, The Lancet, and the New England Journal of Medicine in order to again mislead the public. And meanwhile, many countries in Europe are now seeing record numbers of new infections. The Guardian reports that within 24 hours, the Netherlands reported more than 9,000 new cases. Poland reported more than 12,000 new cases. Germany reported 11,000 new cases. And similar outbreaks are being reported elsewhere in Europe. Now, in the United States, meanwhile, daily cases of the virus have allegedly surpassed 75,000. 
Responses to the virus are mainly being handled state by state. Now, New York City Governor Andrew Cuomo eased some of the lockdown restrictions. And he's also looking at a tiered approach to lockdowns based on the number of infections in each area. And California Governor Gavin Newsom is also easing some of the lockdowns. It's unclear, however, whether this will change. Now, part of the context of this is the protests and lawsuits against the lockdowns. In the United States, for example, there are many legal challenges to these lockdowns, including lawsuits in New York and other places against measures placed on places of worship, alleging these have been unconstitutional. And in Australia and many parts of Europe, there are also anti-lockdown protests, including in Melbourne, Dublin, Naples, and Berlin. Also in some other news, the Vatican went ahead with its deal with the Chinese Communist Party by extending its agreement by two years to recognize bishops appointed by the CCP. Now, as we reported previously, this move was criticized when it was first passed back in September 2018 for putting Christians and Catholics in China at greater risk of persecution by Chinese authorities. Now, in China, there are state-run versions of most religions which alter the original teachings, for example, by striking off the first commandment of the Ten Commandments. And those who refuse to follow the altered versions of their religions face risk of persecution. Now, the move by the Vatican acknowledges the Chinese Communist Party's altered version of the religion. Now, the Vatican itself announced in a press release that the move is to, quote, pursue an open and constructive dialogue for the benefit of the life of the Catholic Church and the good of Chinese people. And in other news, a wave of compromising photographs and videos of Hunter Biden, son of Democrat presidential nominee Joe Biden, is being published by G News. That's a media outlet run by Chinese billionaire Guo Wenghui, who is currently living in the United States after having escaped China back in 2015. Now, the numerous images and videos show Hunter Biden doing drugs, posing explicitly, and engaging in sexual acts with many different women. Guo credits the images he's received to several Chinese figures, including Jiang Jicheng, the grandson of former CCP leader Jiang Zemin. This would align with the connections Guo is known for which include retired Chinese officials and especially tied to the Jiang faction. Now, back in April 2019, Guo accused the Jiang family, the Jiang faction, of embezzling over $1 trillion and said Jiang Jicheng laundered over half of that money overseas. In the posts accompanying the leaked photos and videos of Hunter Biden, Guo alleges that both Hunter Biden and Joe Biden have been compromised by what he describes as the Chinese regime's BGY plan which the Post say aims to use Western politicians, celebrities, and their families who go to China for, quote, greedy wealth, hold women, drugs, make videos, or threaten to make them betray their country, people, and even the safety of these countries to cooperate with the Communist Party to rule the world. It's a quote from their site. Now, BYG is an acronym for Blue, Gold, Yellow. Blue refers to control of the internet, gold refers to buying influence, and yellow refers to honey traps for control through sex and seduction. Guo has announced that his news outlet will continue releasing compromising images and videos of Hunter Biden. It says they have many of them. This is in addition to the other leaks on Hunter Biden, including those of Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani, who allegedly has a copy of a hard drive from Hunter Biden's laptop, including emails showing Hunter Biden allegedly using his father's former position as vice president for financial gain. Now, Joe Biden, meanwhile, is denying these scandals. With a laptop, for example, he alleged in his last debate with President Donald Trump that leaks are part of a Russian disinformation campaign. Several former members of the U.S. intelligence agencies have claimed the leaks are Russian disinformation, but articles citing them contain the caveat that they have no evidence of them being Russian disinformation. And again, these are not official assessments, they're from former officials. Now, in other news, the Democrats are relying heavily on race politics for the November 3rd elections coming up. But how much sway do these really have over voters? To get more insights into race politics and their impact, we invite to speak with us Bishop Aubrey Shines, founder and pastor of G2G Ministries in Tampa Bay, Florida, and founder of the Conservative Clergy of Color. Let's jump into that now. Hey, Bishop Aubrey Shines, it's a real pleasure having you on Crossroads. Excellent being with you guys. Thanks for having me. So I know that in your work, you've done campaigning, you've been involved in the, you know, with the Trump campaign, you've done a lot on race politics in the United States, talking about it from a very different angle from what a lot of people may think. 
And I'm curious because it seems that in the coming elections, 2020 on November 3rd, uh, the Democrats are putting all their eggs in one basket. It does seem to be that's race politics, identity politics, and really trying to just kind of bank on the idea of vote for the other guy who's not Trump. <laughs> and, and I'm curious, in your, in your touring and your research, how much weight do you feel race politics actually has? I think if we were talking maybe a dozen plus years ago, a couple decades ago rather, uh, perhaps it would have had some significance. I think what you're seeing and what the rest of the country is seeing is something, uh, in my opinion, of an anomaly in this regard. Uh, for instance, I as an individual, I travel for Trump. My group, CCC or Conservative Clergy of Color, we don't endorse any, any candidate actually at all. Uh, but several years ago, when I was traveling for then uh, candidate Trump, I already began to see this emergence. We began to see black, white, Hispanic uh, that really began to divorce themselves, and especially white women, begin to divorce themselves from uh, the party of the Democratic Party. Now, take, for instance, right now, they're putting, and I'll use your metaphor, all of their eggs in this one basket. What we're reminding all Americans, especially black and brown people in America, it was the same party right now that is still playing this race game. They're the same party that during the time of our constitution trying to be ratified and pro uh, or post rather that, it was the same party that really forbade the 13th, 14th and 15th amendment unanimously. They didn't want blacks to vote. They always identified people as a entity or a color. So there was always this segregation that's part of the historical landscape of the Democratic Party. This is nothing new here, by the way, unfortunately. Well, I don't see anything really changing because when you look at it, they not only fought 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, they gave you slavery, they gave you the Jim Crow laws, and they fought against even the Civil Rights Bill. Now, again, I get the president signed it at the time because he was outnumbered, but yet he's on record uh, for being someone that even opposed it, uh, even post. Well, do we not still see the same element? Consider Joe Biden. Has he not recently just made the comment that, hey, look, if, if, if you're black and you don't vote for me, boy, that sounds like something very reminiscent of, at least to me, understanding history of a party that always continues to see people not in a Judeo-Christian ethos, but identify them with gender, identify them with, with their ethnicity. We just don't subscribe to it at all. And this is why I believe that we're seeing the polls shifting as it relates to black and brown people that at least historically for the last 40, 50, 60 years that have not voted for the Democrats. All of a sudden they're looking now at the GOP. And I think even as of today, the numbers are somewhere up uh, 30 to 34 percent that they're saying, you know what, uh, we're going to go into a different direction. Now, whether that lives out or not uh, during November 3rd, we're going to all see. But I can tell you from being uh, on the ground level, grassroots issues, we're seeing these things beginning to transform, especially uh, in the minds of black and brown people. So the race identity issue, not working that well right now for the Democratic Party. Now, I know some people would point to the protests and riots that really swept across the country uh, because, you know, there, there did, did look like at least a lot of people. I can tell you a few different things. Epoch Times, we had reporters on the ground. It did seem that a lot of the people who were the more violent types are not really voting Democrat. A lot of them actually oppose Biden. And they're yeah. really pretty radical groups. We, we look at the arrests. Most of them look like white people. Um, yeah. You know, and of course, there, there does seem to have been a lot of grassroots people who went, you know, went out on their own and did protest because they do believe, you know, in the, these ideas to an extent. I'm curious, though, in meeting with voters, meeting with communities, speaking with black voters, um, how, what, you know, how, how much, how many of them really do believe in these race politics and how many of them really do perceive America like it's being portrayed in the media? They don't. I, I can, I, I'm telling you, I do countless interviews. I do countless speeches everywhere, all the time. And I actually shepherd 20 plus different ethnic groups. And so I have a real microcosm of America every single weekend. And I get a chance to hear it. I have those that are PhDs, but I also have those that uh, have been incarcerated for long periods of time, various reasons. 
this race thing is really not gelling with Americans because they're looking at bottom line issues. Take, for instance, education. Even here in the state of Florida, when this current governor got elected, and again, mass media doesn't like talking about this, but it was the 18% of black women that actually put Governor DeSantis in office. Why? Because we made sure that issues like school choice was on the ballot. And as a result, they said, hey, why is it that any group, and that wasn't a white or black issue, by the way, that was an economic issue. That was an issue that was going to benefit uh, guys and girls' kids uh, that were trapped uh, in these failed school systems. So when blacks understand and when our group or in groups like ours uh, give this type of information as far as school choice, prison reform, they're realizing, wait a minute, there's only one group, one candidate that has been talking about this. Why are we still doing the same thing we've been doing for 70 years? We never saw this result. And now we're even looking at guys that have been in the entertainment industry. I don't subscribe to their music and uh, their sexist ideas as they express it through lyrics. But I'm, I'm having to pause and applaud the fact that they are also awakening, saying, hey, what we've been doing for 70 years has not been working at all. We better begin to look at another party because this other party that we've been loyal to, they only come around every four years. They never saw an improvement in their economic base. And all of a sudden, for the first time in America, black and brown and whites as well, we've never seen pre-COVID-19. We never saw the employment numbers the way they are. We never saw a candidate says, hey, why can't these poor kids have an opportunity to take their kids to schools of their choice, whether they're poor, white, black, or brown? Why is it that we are forbidding these individuals from doing so? There's only one party that's talking about that, only one candidate that's been talking about that. And honestly, this is what we're hearing when we're out. And this is why I believe that you're seeing this shifting in the polls because people are awakening Excluding the mainstream media, not helping by simply reporting the news. They're still getting their news for, from alternative sources like ours, and we are making an impact. I'm not boasting when I say it. I know there are other groups, but I'm telling you when we give them this information and when we begin to help them juxtapose the various failed policies of the past, we're seeing black and brown people say, you know what? We're going in a different direction here. That's why I really believe you're, that you're seeing the type of trending that you're looking at right now. Hmm. I think another big conversation right now happening in this country is around these you know, critical race theory trainings and making people aware of race. It's interesting because the narrative used to be don't judge people by the color of their skin. Judge them by their character. Martin Luther King talked about that. And growing up myself even, that was kind of the standard. I had friends of every color, to be honest, that we never really thought about it. And the funny thing is, is they're telling you now that you should look at a person's skin. You should judge them and you should also look at your, the color of your skin and judge your privilege or oppression and, you know, place yourself on the hierarchy of oppression based on that. Um, a big question we have in our country right now is, do people actually believe in these things? And, and to what degree does this hold weight? with the people the Democrats, for example, are more trying to target. Um, to be honest, it seems it's more like white liberals who tend to agree with this because they've been convinced that they're, you know, they have wrongdoing in the past and there's some guilt involved with it. I'm curious when it comes to black, brown communities, how much weight do you believe these narratives actually hold? They're not holding a lot of weight at all. Our group, Conservative Clergy of Color, we just developed, <clears throat> pardon me, actually a curriculum where we're going into corporations and we're teaching what's called how to get to all lives matter. Now, this is an alternative resource that we're saying, hey, we can't segment ourselves based on this idea of race and putting one's gender or race. I, like you, I was raised in a different time. I uh, was raised in a very strong business home. The whole racial issue just was an issue. By the way, I have a Jewish mom, so that's a whole nother issue there as well. And when I look at the bigger picture here, um, I like uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, and I'll go further, even before Dr. King, I think of people like Booker T. Washington. Booker T. says something that is one of my favorite phases of one of the, I think, real, real leaders of both black and white, just a great American. And he said this, he said, there's a group of people that need to keep this race divisiveness alive and well. He says, why? He says they profit from it, 
and it makes them very relative. So they don't really have a desire for this thing to go away because it makes them very prominent. Well, he was echoing those that believed in critical race theory. When you take an individual and you say to that individual, because you're white, you're privileged, well, go tell that to some of the whites that I know in Virginia that have a very difficult time making ends meet and or let's reverse it. What do you say to Barack Obama and Michelle Obama to their children that lives in one percentile? Are they also uh, discriminated against? Is someone white, uh, I don't know, stopping them? Did someone white stop Barack Obama from getting in office? This is ridiculous. It was a majority of whites that put him in the office. If every black in America had even voted for Barack Obama, he still could not have gotten into office. That's mathematically impossible. It was whites that put them in. So when I hear this false narrative that uh, we got to look at each other based on race or gender, well, I like King. I like Booker T. Washington. We don't judge people by the color of their skin, but we really should judge them by the content of their character. And so critical race theory is a Marxist idea. I wrote a book. I know you're aware of it called Eight Answers to Dealing with Racial Issues here. It's out on Amazon, forgive me for the shameless plug there, is doing quite well for a reason because we are addressing those issues. We're saying this is a Marxist idea. It doesn't work. As a matter of fact, my grandfather, my mom's dad, died in a war called World War II fighting against this same critical race theory that existed then in Germany. And we have fought against it. Our country has won this battle but yet you have these segments of our society that want to paint it as there, though there's some sort of racial divide here. Again, if you were talking to me decades and decades ago, we'd have a total different conversation. But when I hear this lie, it's upsetting, it's offensive, because it says to one group of people, you cannot survive unless you have me as a white liberal to help you become a better you. That, my friend, is racism at its best. It's soft bigotry. Every American, whether you're black or white, should denounce it and throw it in the garbage can where it really belongs because it is not an idea of Americanism. And this is what we should all be striving for. Black, white, or brown, it doesn't really, really matter. We should be striving to make our country better and not continue to segregate it by ethnicity. It's a ridiculous concept that has been dealt a major blow already. I hope we continue to defeat it. Hey, Bishop Aubrey Shines, it's a real pleasure having you on Crossroads. Thanks for allowing me to be with you guys. Now that said, folks, we're broadcasting five days a week, Monday through Friday. And again, I also do a live Q&A Sundays, 10.30 p.m. Eastern Time. If you want to support our channel, please also support us on Patreon. You can find the link to that in the description below. And if you haven't already, please also don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps us grow. And if you want to go the extra mile, as always, please consider sharing this video with a friend or family member. Now, with that said, please stay informed and stay free. Mm -hmm.